Open the Word of God to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, today we'll be looking at verses 15 to 17. And I would ask you to stand if you are able for the reading of God's Word. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 17. The Apostle Paul writes, Therefore look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. On account of this, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Father, help me to explain your word this morning and help your people to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Let me read you a little something. Dr. G. Campbell Morgan, the illustrious British expositor, often gave an illustration about work walking circumspectly. He described a beautiful flower garden surrounded by a high wall. Then he envisioned a cat walking carefully among the many pieces of broken glass embedded in the cement at the top of the wall. He would say the cat was surrounded by many dangers, many pieces of glass, but it never cut itself. It walked circumspectly. The followers of Christ have always been confronted by difficulties and dangers, but they who know the will of God step carefully. The old proverb which says, make haste slowly, offers excellent advice. Now as we look at this passage today about walking in wisdom, we we have to comprehend what it's telling us is that as we live life, we have to live life carefully. Because we live in a world that has rejected God We live in a world that has a real devil ruling over it and that we have to walk carefully. That we have to make every effort to understand what God wants of us. So today, we're going to see three ways to walk in wisdom. The first is that you must be careful in all you do. In verse 15. The second is you must use your time well in verse 16. And the third is don't be a fool. Understand what God wants in verse 17. So be careful in all you do. Use your time well. And understand what God wants from you. Don't be a fool. All right, let's look at the first point. Therefore, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. The word um, uh, look, it could be translated, another way to put it would, could be to see to it. To see to it that you are careful in how you walk. We need to we need to, in a sense, be watching ourselves. We've been talking the last few weeks about the Christian walk, our walk with Christ. God has told us so many things that we need to stay away from. Sexual immorality, witchcraft, anger, jealousy, bitterness. We need to be so careful how we walk because we're in a very different situation than the old covenant people of God. Israel had their own nation, their own constitution, and they were, they were to be separate from the other nations. There were so many things that they were told not to do. If you want to be thankful for Christ, spend some time in Leviticus Spend some time in Numbers and Deuteronomy. And look, those are all good laws. Those are our holy God. Those were His ways. And it was all good. But that we're not under that anymore. 
Praise the Lord. And by the way, it was never a way to salvation. It was never a way to salvation. Genesis um, 15, 6, Abraham believed God and God accounted it to him as righteousness. There's the gospel right there. That's why Galatians says that God preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand. The, the law was mainly a way of sanctification, of walking, of walking with Yahweh. But that law is still good. It's still holy. It's still God's Word. Much to learn. But we're not under that obligation, those obligations, because we've been freed in Christ. And so we are, we are, we are freed from the demands of the law in particular, but we are, we are not free to not walk in holiness, to not walk with God, because He frees us to walk with Himself. And so we're in a very different situation than them, because we, the way I, this is the way I kind of look at the church. The church is, is the exile flipped on its head. Let me, let me explain what I mean. If you read the Old Testament, I'm not going to go to all the verses, but there's a lot, where God tells Israel that if you obey me, you're going to be blessed, you're going to inherit the land, you're going to have all these blessings. If you disobey me, you're going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to essentially kick you out of the land, and it's over, for a time at least. Because there's other verses that say that no matter what, God says, I'm going to restore you and you're, you're going to be in the land and the nations are going to be blessed through you. So wait a minute. God is not contradicting Himself. But we say, okay, on the one hand, you're telling them if they obey you, they'll receive the blessings and the nations will be blessed through them. But if they disobey you, you're going to, to, to judge them and kick them out of their own land and they're going to be dispersed among the nations just like they are now. And by the way, even though that Israel is in the land now, they are still under Gentile power. This is not the redeemed Israel of prophecy. They're still under Gentile power. They're not under Christ. So, well, how is God, just to keep it simple, going to fulfill His, His, His plan to bless the nations, including Israel, if they fail? And they did fail. And they were kicked out of the land. And ever since that time, every time that they've been back in the land, even in the time of Jesus till now, they have been under Gentile power. That is not the promise. Well, how is God going to fulfill His plan? Here's what God does with the church and after the resurrection of Jesus. God starts saving all the Gentiles that surround his scattered people. So Israel, his people were, were sent back to the were sent were just scattered across the globe. And what God does is he starts saving everybody around them. That's the church. He starts building this Gentile church. And what does Romans say? So as to provoke them to jealousy. And this is the age we live in. So God had a plan to flip the exile in his head. Okay, Israel was disobedient. What I'm going to start doing is start saving the nations. And I'm going to glorify myself that way. So we live in a time, and that's why we Christians are called uh, exiles like Israel, because we were saved during the time of Israel's banishment and punishment. And we find ourselves in, in a similar situation that they find in their exile. They, I mean, Jeremiah tells the exiles in Israel um, to, uh, to, to basically forget about being restored to the land right now, prosper in the city where God has sent you. And of course, um, we understand that most, most Jews in the world today are not saved, though there are some. But as we, non-Jews, get saved, we find ourselves in a similar situation. All of a sudden we're saved, we become a part of the God of Israel, and we find ourselves in the nations that don't honor God. So how do we walk in cultures that are permeated by 
anti-God ways. Well, we have to be careful. We have to walk with exactness. Precision. Warren Wearsby says the opposite would be walking carelessly and without proper guidance and forethought. We cannot leave the Christian life to chance. We must make wise decisions and seek to do the will of God. What we, what we have uh, read before in Ephesians, that when we talked about walking in the light, are related to these verses. Remember, Paul uh, quotes, Awake, O sleeper, let Christ shine on you. In other words, don't walk in your sleep, wake up, open your eyes, make the most of the day. It's sad to see so many professing Christians drifting like sleepwalkers, not really making the most of opportunities to live for Christ and serve Him. Watch carefully, contrast sharply with the state of believers who are sleeping. And the Apostle Paul here has a particular concern for our witness before this pagan world, this non-Christian world that surrounds us. Careful carries the idea of alertness. As believers walk through the spiritual minefield of the world, they are to be constantly alert to every danger Satan puts their way. This is what Pilgrim's Progress is all about, that allegory. As, as, as the character Christian walks and he meets different people and circumstances, it's all about his walk with God and his growth and his progress. So walk carefully, the apostle says, not as unwise, but as wise. This is consistent with Paul's prayer for his readers in Ephesians 1.17 that God will impart wisdom to them through His Spirit. But this isn't a worldly wisdom. The Bible talks about the wisdom of the world. God promises to destroy the wisdom of the wise in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19. And he, 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 by the way, the apostle there is citing Isaiah 29, 14. It was this kind of wisdom, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 6 to 8, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 6 to 8 tells us, that led the rulers of the world to crucify Christ. There is a wrong wisdom. The Greek word for um, wisdom is Sophia. Okay? Philosophy is the love, philo, of wisdom. The Bible tells us to be careful of deceptive philosophy. But there is a wisdom that comes from God. Only a fool drifts with the wind and tide. A wise man marks out his course, sets his sails, and guides the rudder until he reaches his destination. When a man wants to build a house, he first draws his plan so he knows what he is doing. How many of us Christians use our opportunities wisely? Now, yes, James tells us in James chapter 4, verses 13 to 17, to, in all our plans, say if the Lord wills. So we have to have that attitude in here. But it is also true that a planned life can deal better with unexpected events. We can plan, but we submit our plans to Him. Sometimes He messes them up but he knows what he's doing because to mess up our plans is always good. The walk by which we Christians should live should not be a carefree, freewheeling attitude, but one that demonstrates sober thinking and careful diligence. And if we lack wisdom, what does James 1.5 tell us? It tells us we can ask God and he will give to us liberally. Colossians 4.5 says, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. And then our second point this morning is to use your time well. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wisdom involves a right use of time. Um, We don't 
think of time as a commodity. We think of money as a commodity. But we don't think of time as a commodity. Let me give you an example. You could be so obsessed with saving a penny. That's it's good. It's good to save money and not be foolish. But you could be so obsessed with it, you could, you could be in Wegmans and say, oh, this is cheaper at Tops. You got, you got 99% of your groceries at Wegmans. Okay? But this is cheaper at Tops. It's, it's 30 cents cheaper, but it's cheaper. And your obsessive mind just can't let it go. And then you're wondering, am I being a good steward? Am I being a good steward? And that's fine, I'm not mocking you, but here's what you have to think. It's going to take you, let's just say, I'm, I haven't done the math, it takes you an extra 10 minutes for that trip. No, no, that would just be the drive. It's going to take you an extra half hour for that trip to Tops. Was the 30 cents worth the half hour of your time? You're not going to live forever, folks. And so, 30 minutes, for me, I'll have the 30 minutes. I don't know what I'm going to do with them, but I'll have the 30 minutes over the 30 cents. Because I've got, we act as if we, if we had limit, unlimited time on this planet, that would be okay, but we don't. So we have to balance that out. Time is, is limited. It's, it's a commodity. And Paul says redeeming the time, that's literally buying up the time or buying up the season. The Greek is in the middle voice, meaning that we're buying the time for ourselves. But of course, we shouldn't be using it for ourselves, but for our master, because we're his slaves. Now, there's two word for, words for time in the original Greek. Um, the one that this doesn't use is chronos, which is is basically how you measure time, minutes, seconds, hours. This, this word for time, kairos, denotes a measured, allocated, fixed season or epoch. So it's a season, it's, it's kind of a general um, m- amount of time. So Paul's going to talk later that we live in this present evil age. So we live in an evil age, but we as we've seen in Ephesians, that have already been made part of the age to come. We are already, in a sense, in the age to come because our spirits have been born again. These spirits are going to survive the destruction of this universe. And so we live in the present evil age, but we are a part of the age to come. So we are asked to redeem this evil age as much as possible. Homer Kent said, the point is that Christians need to employ their spiritual knowledge so as to grasp every opportunity for fulfilling Christian duty and displaying spiritual fruit. Our English word opportunity comes from the Latin and means towards the port. It suggests a ship taking advantage of the wind and tide to arrive safely in the harbor. The brevity of life is a strong argument for making the best use of the opportunities God gives us. Napoleon said this, Napoleon said, there is in the midst of every great battle a 10 to 15 minute period that is the crucial point. Take that period and you win the battle, lose it and you will be defeated. MacArthur points out that the great 16th century reformer Philip Melanchthon, he was Luther's successor, kept a record of every wasted moment and took his list to God at the confession in excuse me, took his list to God personally in confession confession at the end of each day. It's a small wonder that God used him in such great ways. Uh, They talk about, um, you might have heard of Jonathan Edwards' resolutions. One of them was to not waste a moment. R.C. Sproul says, we are called to be productive Christian people. And in order to be productive, we must be careful with our use of time. To make the most of every opportunity means to make a wise use of time so that the things we are doing are productive and helpful, not destructive and wasteful. John MacArthur says, when we have opportunity to do something for his namesake and for his glory, we should do it with all we have. 
every moment of every day should be filled with things good, things righteous, things glorifying God. Galatians 6.10 says, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. I don't want to waste time. You should not want to waste time. I want to be productive every day. I want this ministry to be productive every day. Now, in that I have to realize part of a good use of time is relaxation. Part of a good use of time is fellowship. And so, we have to allow within that use of time, time to be interrupted and time to just fellowship and not be like, hey, i got to get busy. I only got five minutes. Right? We've got to allow for that because that's a part of the good use of time. We shouldn't be working every minute. Today's the Lord's Day. I think we should try to rest as much as possible on this day. God created the earth in six days. He rested the seventh. We still have that model. Jesus rose again on the first day of the week. This is a day where we should rest in God's work of salvation for us. And every day we should have a time of, for rest and for fellowship. But if your time is being, if you're, if you're spending too much time and being entertained, or too much time in, in pointless conversations. Look, I'm not trying to be, have conversations, not all conversations have to a point. It's good to fellowship. But if you're just talking all day and you're not doing what God has called you to do, that's an issue. If you're just watching TV all day and not being productive, and, and remember, we're not saved by works, but we're called to good works. We are created in Him as His workmanship because He prepared us for good works before the world began. We should be very, very productive people for Christ's kingdom. So yes, there, part of that is make time for conversation, make time for rest, make time for laughing, because you're going to be more productive if you rest. But we have to be intentional about that. The days are evil. The days are evil. Paul reminds them that the days are evil. I think that's talking about the moral corruption of the day. It may also be signifying the coming Roman persecution that was about to come. Folks, we may be headed for some persecution. Look, I, I, look, I believe in the rapture. I believe that Jesus could come at any moment. I do. And I believe that that believers are going to be spared from the wrath of God in the tribulation. But nowhere does God promise that we will be spared from all tribulation. It is general of this age, and I think some, I, I, I see this, I'm not picking on anyone, I see this a thousand times, that's an exaggeration, but I just, i got to be honest, this attitude concerns me, it grieves me, that we Christians are so... The rapture was not meant, the, the blessing of the rapture is not that you get to escape the tribulation. That might be a side benefit. The blessing of the rapture is that you won't die. You will be, be transformed when Christ comes. You will be made, you will never have to see death. But for so many believers, the big thing about the rapture is we get to escape the tribulation, persecution. The Bible nowhere promises, it says if you are godly, you will live in persecution. And if the rapture doesn't happen tomorrow, and by the way, it might not, it might, you may, we may be headed for persecution, not the great tribulation. I'm not talking about that. But we may be headed for persecution. Have you seen what's going on in the world? Have you seen what's going on with China? Have you heard the wars and the rumors of wars? We might have to go through some stuff. Don't be afraid. And don't use God's blessings as an excuse to be afraid. Be ready. God will help you through it. And let me tell you something. 
Some of you don't have to go through tribulation. You're already going through it. You're already going through sicknesses. You're already going through family troubles. <laughs> You're already going through it. It can't get much worse. Right? So we have to be ready because we live in an evil age. So we have to redeem the time. We must purposely engage in buying time back from the mere use of self if our life is going to amount to anything. Paul reminds his readers that they are living in the midst of the present evil age, which is not only full of enticements to sin, but is, but is an age that will come to end. This is one of the reasons why Paul will tell us later in Ephesians 6 to 13 to put on the armor of God. Why? Because we're in a spiritual battle. And this is what another commentator says. He says, nevertheless, Paul does not advise them to passively find a safe place to wait until Christ returns, but to participate with the risen Christ in a mission to fill the world with the good news of redemption. We are not just to cower and wait for Christ to come back. When he comes back, that's going to be awesome. I do hope I'm alive during that event, and I might be. Because I believe it could happen at any time. But we are not just called to wait about it and to create charts and figure out exactly when it's going to happen. In fact, we're told to not do that. I don't know why we keep doing that. And there's all these soft predictions going on. They may not be giving dates, but it'll be in a couple months. It'll be in a couple years. That's predicting. I call that soft predicting. In the meantime, we are to fill the world with the good news. We are on a mission. We are this as we live in this evil, dark time, those of us that have been born again are the breaking in of the new covenant age into this world. Don't you, don't you love when we get little hints of spring? Did anyone smell the air this morning? But it's still cold. It's still winter. And we've had in the past few weeks, we've had some really nice, warm spring days. It's like, oh, it's coming. But then we get the ice storm. That's the age to come. We're still in winter. Satan is still ruling this world. He's still been, but spring is breaking in. The new covenant is breaking in through his church. We're spring. We're the, the fragrance of life. We're the fragrance of the new age to this world. And we need to be aggressive in bringing the new age. Don't think of new age. How they've, how they've, I'm not talking about the New Age philosophy that's demonic and evil. I'm talking about the coming age of Christ, the good New Age. We need to bring Christ's kingdom because Christ's kingdom is starting to break into this world. Come on. This present age is still under the control of the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2.2. And we are still part of this evil age, Galatians 1.4. Therefore, believers still have to live out the life of the age to come, which they already enjoy, in a surrounding moral climate, which is predominantly evil. I want to give you a little story here um, from MacArthur. He says, I don't know if I'm saying this right, uh, Kefa Sampangi, whose story is told in the book A Distant Grief, Regal Books, from Regal Books, was a national pastor in Africa and barely escaped with his family from brutal oppression and terror in his home country in Uganda. They made their way to Philadelphia where a group of Christians began caring for them. It makes me think of David Grange and taking care of the refugees in Philly. One day his wife said, Tomorrow I am going to go and buy some clothes for the children. And immediately she and her husband broke into tears because of the constant threat of death under which they had lived so long. This was the first time in many years they had dared even speak the word tomorrow. What a blessing. And they ended up going back to Africa, Uganda, and things were free for a while. And then later that... Um, Adi Amin came to power, so they went through it again. Look, folks, Christians in the world are already going through tribulation. They're already being martyred. They're all, we're in it. This country, let me be more specific. 
The powers that run this country are evil. They're evil. And many of us, many of our our citizens are evil too because they don't have Christ. We are allowing evil things. The slaughter of the innocents. This is an evil age. So, we need to recognize we live in an evil age. We need to, we need to take every opportunity to redeem the time. So we need to think about this, NFBC. We maybe can't change the world. Only, only, first of all, only Christ can change the world. But He has not called us to just sit here and have holy huddles. How can we make an impact on Lewiston and Niagara Falls? What can we do? And it's not just the elders, it's not just the deacons. What can we do? We put an ad in the Sentinel a couple weeks ago. That's a start. We, 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 Lord willing, we continue being a witness at the Peach Parade and things like that. Lord willing, we'll, we're going to go out into the streets and do some evangelism. We've got to be aggressive. Look, we may not be big, but we've got an army here. This is an arm. This is pretty significant. We can do a lot of damage for the kingdom. We need to redeem the time. We need to buy it back and say, no, devil, two o'clock does not belong to you. I'm going to use two o'clock for your glory. Again, I don't want you to think that that doesn't mean you can't relax. You can because you need to be recharged like anything else. But it's everything you do as a kingdom purpose. Number three, don't be a fool. Understand what God wants. The Greek word for fool is used frequently in the Septuagint for one that denies God. Now the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And so the Greek word for fool that's used in Septuagint and here in Scripture is for the reason that it's, it's bringing that Old Testament Greek version to our attention is for context to know how this word is generally used. So fool is a denier of God. The senselessness of pagan conduct, when we say pagan, we mean unbelievers, is due to the fact that such persons have no understanding of God's will. Believers, however, may act in accord with knowledge, for they possess in Scripture the objective revelation of God's will and the indwelling spirit to interpret it to them. The Spirit of God will assist, will assist the submissive believer in applying the revelation of God's will to the circumstances of life. The Spirit is key to walking in wisdom. We'll see that next week. But the Holy Spirit is the promise of this new covenant age we're in. Now, I believe very, very strongly that everyone in the Old Testament, or that, no, not everyone, but I believe very, very strongly that the Holy Spirit was with His people in the Old Testament. Very strongly. People were born again. They were saved. Here's what I believe is the difference between the Old Covenant people and the New Covenant people. Not everyone in the Old Covenant had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was an empowering for service that was only given to select individuals, Moses and others. Remember, Moses says in one place, I wish that, you would all pro- that they would all prophesy. In the New Testament, every believer that comes into the church is given the promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 13 makes that clear. And every believer is not given the same gift, but every believer is given a gift. So we all, if you are a believer, have been, as 1 Corinthians 13 makes so clear towards the end of the chapter, have been given the fullness of the Spirit. In fact, as we have baptism tonight, water baptism is just a, and I shouldn't say just a, but it is a wonderful symbol that represents the reality of the Holy Spirit in the person's lives who are going under the water. In light of the urgency to make the most of our time, not being foolish includes, among other things, not becoming anxious or panicked. It also includes not being drunk, as we'll see in verse 18. We'll look more at next week. Don't be drunk. Don't be drunk. Look, we, we've, we've, we've all understand, it's hit me, it's hit many of us, the idea of, of having a drink or getting drunk to, to ease the world's problems. Paul says, don't do that. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. 
It is never God's will for a Christian to be drunk. Never. Can you drink wine? Yeah. 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 And, and don't be too legalistic about that because if you're too legalistic, sometimes it'll drive people to the extreme. But you are not to get drunk. You are not to get filled with wine it's to the point that it impacts your judgment. I've made a choice. Well, the Bible asks, or excuse me, not the Bible. Um, the church the church, the Bible tells us to be wise on this. The church asks the leaders to refrain. Our church constitution asks our leaders to refrain from that, and I do, because it's just wise. Don't even get near it. But even if you drink a little, you, have to, you, you can never get drunk. You have to be careful. Getting drunk is a bad use of your time. It is wasted time. Our Kent Hughes says, drunkenness immerses one in the flow of the evil days and makes life a series of missed opportunities. That is a tragic waste. You may have missed a lot of opportunities for God being drunk or being anxious, but you could change that now. And then he says, understand what the will of the Lord is. Verse 10 has already spoken of proving what is well-pleasing unto the Lord. We referred to this a lot over the last few days, but just turn to Romans chapter 12. Let's turn to Romans chapter 12. Or last few Sundays, I should say. Just turn to Romans chapter 12. Therefore I exert you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a sacrifice, living, holy, and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may approve what the will of God is, that which is good and pleasing and perfect. Amen. The Christian faith is more than an emotional experience. As believers, we're called to use our mental capabilities to the fullest extent for the highest of all goals, the comprehension of and response to the will of God. And look, I guess I've got to remind you as I'm saying this, and as Ephesians has told us earlier so, so forcefully and encouragingly, we're not saved by works. Oh, what a relief. The blood of Jesus covered my sins. But we are freed up and called to do good works. That's the best use of time. And by the way, you're going to be happier when you're serving God. I have to say that with a caveat. There's going to be seasons in your life where it seems like serving God is bringing you more trouble, and it very well may. But it's worth it. It's worth it to be a part of His kingdom. And Peter says, for those that are going through stuff, that after you have suffered a little while, God Himself will restore, strengthen, and establish you. Well, let me just read this from Warren Wearsby because I think it's real good. Just listen in. Too many Christians have the idea that discovering God's will is a mystical experience that rules out clear thinking. But this idea is wrong and dangerous. We discover the will of God as He transforms the mind. Romans 12, 1-2. And this transformation is the result of the Word of God. Prayer, meditation, and worship. If God gave you a mind, then He expects you to use it. This means that learning His will involves gathering facts, examining them, and weighing them, and praying for His wisdom. Believers need to reason out for themselves what they should do. If God saved me, He has a purpose for my life, and I should discover that purpose and then guide my life accordingly. He reveals His plan through His Word, His Spirit in our hearts, and the working of circumstances. This is, this is, this is how God works. We um, so many Christians have a, just, a, just a mystical idea that you know, God's going to uh, give them some extra revelation about what they need to do. Um, there's some sort of mystical experience. That's not how it works. We're to pray and seek Him, but always have this Bible before us as it, as it changes us and it transforms our mind. And we, we have to think through, Lord, does this please you? Does 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 watching this movie please you? You know, and sometimes believers are going are to come to different conclusions about some of these matters because it's like ungodliness surrounds everything we touch. 
And, and the answer is not total isolation from the world, but this is why we have to walk in wisdom to make sure we're not being corrupted by the ways of the world. And as we're in God's Word, as we're fellowshipping with His people, as we're fellowshipping with the Spirit, He guides us. And thankfully, it's not of works. Thankfully, our salvation is already secure. But we need to, um, there's just this anti-intellectual idea that we're not, we're, the Bible says to worship the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul. So we have to, we have to spend a lot of time thinking and analyzing and, 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 and going over things and just the things that, that are in our home and that are in our lives, Lord, do they please you? And there's going to be what seems to be a lot of gray areas. We, just, we have to depend on God for wisdom and be willing to his leading. Turn to Proverbs uh, chapter 10, verse 23, 23. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 23. You get a little Old Testament on this. Proverbs 10, 23. And Solomon writes, Doing wickedness is like laughing to a fool, and so is wisdom to a man of discernment. Turn to Proverbs chapter 2. Slip over a few. Proverbs chapter 2. Let's just read the first nine verses of Proverbs 2. Listen to these. This is old. So you want wisdom? Get in the book of Proverbs. Read a proverb every day for this month. Read a proverb every day. My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you to make your ear pay attention to wisdom, incline your heart to discernment. For if you call out for understanding, give your voice for discernment. If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of Yahweh and find the knowledge of God. For Yahweh gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and discernment. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright, a shield to those who walk in integrity to guard the paths of justice, and he keeps the way of his holy ones. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity in every good track. In verse 10, let me just finish there. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. And listen to this. You can turn back to Ephesians. Wisdom isn't just knowledge. Wisdom is the, the, the skill that the Holy Spirit gives you in knowing how to use the Bible knowledge you have. It's skill in using it because knowledge puffs up. Wisdom is using that knowledge. In the new covenant that we're in, the Spirit of God is in this process. Amen? Ephesians 1.17. Ephesians 6.17. Clinton Arnold write, discerning, discerning Jesus' will probably entails discerning how the resurrected Lord would want His people to respond to every moral choice they are confronted with in the day-to-day life. Colossians 1.9 says, We are filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Lincoln writes, another commentator, Bible commentator, For believers, wise living involves a practical perception dependent on the direction of their Lord. Turn to 1 Peter. First Peter chapter 4, verses 1 to 2. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to no liver, excuse me, so as to no longer live the rest of the time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. And Peter goes on to say, You've already spent enough time in sensuality and sin. So in Christ, you can be forgiven of your past. Many, you are, many of you are. Now go forward in the future and use the time for God. We are not to be thoughtless. We must understand our Master's will so that we can form just conceptions of daily duty. And in the midst of the perplexity of conflicting obligations, not lose time. 
we're perplexed. There's so many things around us, but with God's help, we will not lose time. There are many, many choices before us. Many, many decisions to wait, make. But God's word gives us wisdom. And I want to just reinforce this note that we're saved by grace. Because there is a lot of things we face in this world where it's just, again, it's so um, ungodliness, um, antichrist ideas are everywhere. They're in the things we read, the things we watch, the schools we go to, that we send our kids to. They're everywhere. And the Bible, the Bible is going to transform our minds, but sometimes for particular situations such as What's, what's the proper use of my time? What's the proper use of entertainment? Um, sometimes, again, we have to wrestle and think through these things, and we need to please God, and we need to be obedient to Him. But in that, remember, we're saved by God's grace. We're saved by, because sometimes it could seem a burden with the decisions we make and the choices we have to make. We want to please God, and sometimes we don't know what to do, we're trying to seek His will in the gray areas. We have to rest on the fact that we're saved by God's grace. Ephesians says earlier, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man boast. We're not working our salvation through the daily decisions we make, but we should want to please God. Some people make the mistake thinking that they please God by, by living their good life. Others would say, as long as I'm saved, they may not say this outright, but they, they, they show it with their lives or their attitudes, but because I'm saved, I don't have to worry about my life. No, you've been free from the penalty and the judgment of sin because of Christ. Now, Buy back that time that He's given you from the enemy. Try to re he's redeemed you. Try to redeem every moment. But we need to rest on the fact because if you come at this from, this is why, you know, the Bible talks about this in Romans 14, areas that are gray matters, areas where there's different opinions, maybe not a clear word in Scripture, the Bible says in Romans 14, one believer doesn't have, have problems eating meat in the idol's temple because he knows they're, the, the, the idols, they're all false gods, and he's just thanking God for the meat so he doesn't care. The other believer says, no, I can't even eat, I can't even eat meat in an idol's temple because um, it bothers me. These idols, these were, I, just, I can't take it. It's associated, I can't do it. One believer, drawing to, to contemporary day, has no problem with Christmas. They don't care about all the pagan stuff, and a lot of that is blown out of proportion, as I tried to make clear. But there is obviously some pagan influence that I don't care. I'm selling it unto Christ. I'm, I'm redeeming this back for Christ. Another believer, I can't. I just, there's too much pagan. <laughs> I just, I see it everywhere. I can't do it. These are areas where we can, we can disagree, but each one the heart of the Scripture is that we should be trying to please God. And we don't want to go against our conscience. We want to do everything out of faith because whatever is not of faith is sin. And so we, we, we need to think about these things and try to please God and walk carefully. But rest that Jesus Christ has saved you. He doesn't condemn us for a false step. He's our Savior. His blood has made us clean. And I'm talking here about things that, you know, are questionable matters. Uh, there are things in Scripture it's clear to do, and if you're, if you're living in constant sin without repentance, like if you're living in fornication or sensuality, but you say you're a believer, you need to check yourself. Because now you're, you're, you're disobeying what He clearly says don't do. 
But even with that, those kind of things, believers fall and our salvation rests on what Christ did for us. He is our righteousness. Our, we were looking today, John Bunyan realized one day that his righteousness was in heaven. Everything that's going to get us to heaven and get us to God is, is with Christ there. It's not here. When I die, the only thing I'll say, if I have to say anything, because I know God knows, is His blood. His blood is why I'm going in. Nothing I did. Any good work that I did for the kingdom was what He created me to do after my salvation. But my salvation rests in Him. And that is so important as we, we come to communion that you, you know that your salvation is in Christ. And so, if you're going to take communion today, make sure that Jesus Christ is your Savior. And if you are a believer, He's forgiven you. He'll never let you go. You're, you're perfect in His eyes. But He still wants us to take communion with the right heart. So there will be a time for examination. So at this time, I'm going to ask um, Bonnie and uh, Greg to come up and we're going to do our last song. And then right after that, Carl, if you and the men will come up and uh, we'll have communion together. Thank you, Pastor Sam, for uh, that great message in Ephesians, which is my favorite book. I was saved at the age of, of uh, 44, and my life verses are what you quoted, Sam, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Thank you so much for that. Uh, if you could all please stand, if you're able to, and we're going to sing uh, hymn number 255, Jesus Paid It All. In Isaiah 118, it says, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Jesus has paid it, paid it all. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper's spot. And melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. For nothing good have I, whereby thy grace to claim. My garments white in the blood of Calvary's lamb. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne, I stand in him complete. Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Sing it again. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed.
crushed it white as snow. 